The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. It is Friday, the last Friday of June, the 26th of June, and you're here at Lunch and Learn. We have a guest speaker today, but she's a familiar guest speaker. This is uh, Barb Suter, uh, Dr. Suter's wife. She's going to be talking about uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation and the old future is gone, as you can see in the title here. Uh, I'm not going to do any more introduction. We want to give her as much time as possible. People will be muted until towards the end, and if Barb's up for questions, she'll uh, say so, and then we'll get folks unmuted. So, Barb, thanks so much for being with us again. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for having me. For those of you who have chosen, uh, I have called this The Old Future's Gone, and I have. It comes from a song, um, a really nice song from the 90s, and the refrain went, The Old Future's Gone. We can't get to there from here, because that future is gone. And that's pretty much how it, it, it it really seems to be playing out for us. Um, when I did the first COVID-19 talk back in March, I asked you to please t uh, keep two words kind of in the back of your mind. And those words were provide and protect. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing today. Uh, provide and protect. That seems to be a part of the theme going on here. And we're not done with it. So back in the first one, it was why, how do I provide for me and my loved ones in order that we are protected? Who needs my provisions? Who needs my protection? What needs it? Um, it is now expanded a little bit. Um, so for those of you who have taken our Alpha Theta Protocol uh, workshop, you know that I spent from my early 30s to my mid to late 40s studying with various, shama various shamanic teachers. Um, and that in that, I ended up being taught to step out of my um, assumptions and to challenge some of those assumptions. And in that challenging, uh, to being able to get a bigger point of view. Um, so in that big point of view, the way that I get there the fastest is through symbolic languaging. So I'm going to use today, I'm using all of the imagery that I have today comes from my portion of the Alpha Theta workshop where I talk about the hero's journey. And I'm doing this because whenever I choose an image, I do so with a forethought. It is very carefully chosen because my words are going to be speaking to your conscious mind. But the imagery and the emotions that get evoked is the communication for the subconscious mind. So if you've taken that workshop from us, I'm kind of jiggly joggling your subconscious mind um, in order for there to be a, even if it's not fully conscious remembrance, but kind of, oh yeah, um, uh, with regard to the information. And if you've never taken that um, workshop, um, I'm still jiggly, jiggly joggling your subconscious with that same language. In our culture, we tend to focus. It's like our attention hits the sticky paper, you know, the fly paper um, of the facts and the figures. And that's all we end up looking at. But if we take a step back, like on a, uh, and, and see more of the context of what's happening, especially when we are in unknown terrain, we end up being able to plot our way forward um, more easily. Way back in the day, <laughs> I was given a task by my teachers to, um, I had to carry a, an object up to the top of the mountain, I had the, a, a trail that I was to follow, and then I was to come back down. I had X number of hours to complete my task. And so I was like, yeah, okay, I'm an experienced hiker. I'm not afraid of being out on, on my own. I know how to use a compass. I'm used to hiking both on the trail and off the trail. Um, and so I headed out. And about an hour into the, um, the hike in this desert terrain, I come across a huge rock slide. And I mean huge. And it's very unstable. There's no way I'm getting over this thing. It's just too unstable. So I figure how hard is it to just go up? <laughs> I tell them to start going. So using my compass and with all of my 
perhaps foolish confidence, I headed on out and uh, I eventually got to the top of that mountain. And it was bare, by the way, a lot of uh, having to go up sideways and uh, et cetera. But I got there and I, I left the object I was to leave. And um, I was just kind of standing there enjoying the beauty. I mean, it was just stunningly gorgeous. And I'm out in the desert, so you can see pretty far. You can't judge the distances well out in the desert, but you can see far. And as I'm looking, I see a trail. And the building where, where I was headed towards, where I eventually had to get back to, had this long um, thing up into the sky. It's not like a spire. It was, I don't know what it was, just this long, pokey thing up into the sky and I could see that and it looked to me from where I was that the trail that I just spied went right there maybe to the back entrance so <laughs> that higher point of view changes things um, so I didn't know how to get to the trail from where I was but I knew how to use my compass to get myself there and um, that was the way in which I found my way back so um, that's kind of, we can stay with the facts and the figures and the assumed, this trail is open. And if I can't go along the trail, I'm done. Um, but that wasn't the case in that, and it isn't the case in any hero's journey. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. I'm attempting to broaden this point of view in order that each of us in our own way, get connected um, to the context and in that way, we have a little bit more of our intuitive subconscious nudging available to us. Oh, oh dear. Okay. I hope you can see this okay. Yeah, um, we can see it fine. Okay. So the hero's journey, the long and the short of it, is that we journey from that which is known to that which is unknown and back again said another way we journey out of our comfort zone into our deep vulnerability and then we make our way until that comfort this this uncomfortable zone becomes our comfort zone and along the way we find things out about ourselves and maybe we end up rewriting the narrative about who we are about what happened this is what we do when we're working with clients in the alpha theta protocol um, we change uh, the narratives, we help them change the narratives, we help them change perhaps their belief from uh, I can't to I can. Um, uh, and along that way, when we come back, we come back with um, uh, the elixir, as Joe Campbell called it. And the elixir in this case is going to be wisdom. Joe Campbell based his hero's journey on an anthropologist by the name of Gannep, who in 19, I think it was 1913, wrote a paper. And in that, he identified that no matter what the culture was, no matter what the name, the, the, the people's gods were, uh, no matter where they were on the planet, every single group of humans had a um, initiatory process at different stages of their lives. And that that initiatory process was one that always had a before and an after and that that was the hero's journey. What, what Campbell did, what Joe Campbell did, was to take this out of it being a cultural community event into it being a personal journey that we take in order that we grow and that we change. And that's how I'm going to look at it through the, this lens now. Every single hero's journey has with it a refusal uh, this is Gandalf, and he is meeting with Bilbo and says, I can't find anybody to join us. You know, why don't anybody want to go on the hero's journey? And Bilbo, typical human response, this is what we all do, is that they're nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things, and by golly, they make you late for dinner. It's one of my favorite responses. <laughs> I don't want to be late for dinner. Um, and this is the refusal to the call to adventure. When we're working with a client, I often share in the Alpha Theta workshop, I talk about the gal I worked with um, 
who at a certain point, because she wasn't responding, uh, took the advice and went and had uh, testing for hidden food allergies. And she had food allergies up the wazoo. I, I mean, the list was longer than I stand, I think. And, um, and then she kind of left and disappeared. And about 10 years later, I heard from her again. And she had literally not made one change, not one, not one at all. And she was now so ill, she could barely get out of bed. This is a classic refusal to go on the journey. And if you look at the, the, the situation we find ourselves in, how you could look at it, these are the people actually who are saying things like, um, oh, it'll be gone by spring. Oh, it's no worse than the flu. Oh, I don't have to wear a mask. Oh, you're, you know, no mask, you know, that's my freedom. These are, this is human nature. It's neither good nor bad. Um, it's really the refusal to change. And that, that, that's kind of built into us. We feel safer when we don't change. Um, so I see a lot of that around me right now is that some of us have answered the call because we're going through this globally. Um, and others of us have yet to answer that call. Um, what ends up happening when people refuse to answer the call is they have a system failure. <laughs> like that gal who couldn't barely get out of bed, right? And a system failure is where everything that's worked for us before is not working and we have no choice. We don't know how to fix it. Um, and that's one of the hallmarks. That's another hallmark of the hero's journey. And the hero's journey never comes as an invitation in our mailbox. And it seldom comes with any warning. It's more like um, the twister that lifts Dorothy's house up off of her foundations and lands you in the, in the land of Oz. Um, it's more like Neo. Uh, who, who um, ended up with his computer going wacky and his whole world being turned upside down. Um, and to some degree, this is also part and parcel of the hero's journey. We have system failures. If you look globally, if you look just at our country, many of our systems are failing beneath the weight of this pandemic. If you look at our uh, medical supply systems, if you look at our healthcare system, uh, if you look at our um, monetary system, um, there are so many potential failures, so many wobbles. It is almost as though all of our systems were built on a fault line that we did not know was there. As a result, every single one of us, as we make our way through uh, this hero's journey, will find ourselves feeling really kind of confused certainly uncertain, uh, unclear about how to proceed. Remember, if you have opened your office or have picked up your, um, your professional engagement, think back to how much you were like, well, God, how do I do this? How do, how do I protect myself? How do I protect my clients? What are the steps I need to take? We actually had a really good, um, really good presentation on it um, a few weeks, a uh, number of weeks back now. Um, you know, there are legal ramifications and uh, all kinds of things. And that is how the systems have failed. And all of that confusion and trepidation and um, uncertainty are part and parcel of us attempting to find our way. In every hero's journey, there is always a sense of deep isolation. And in the Alpha Theta Protocol, I talk about, we can even make this isolation worse by thinking things like, no one understands what happened to me, or um, no one knows, and no one can understand what I've gone through, what I, what I am going through, or how hard this is. And we end up, I mean, in COVID-19, we were all literally physically isolated, and it was global which is amazing to me, just amazing. Um, many, many years ago, Richard and I sat at uh, the, di <laughs> the dinner table of, um, with an Ojibwe medicine man. And we were talking about, uh, you know, cabinets and kings, all these different things. And the topics turned to uh, the disregard for our environment, our waterways, our air, um, all of the chemicals being dumped. 
And at a certain point, he said, um, do not worry about the sacred mother. She has only to shrug and that which is bothering her will be cast off. When COVID, when Richard and I, because we watched this like from the very beginning, um, uh, and at a certain point, as especially as Italy, as it has it hit Italy, um, I can remember saying to Richard, I, I, I think the sacred mother just shrugged. This isn't going away. So um, we are here in the middle of this. And as a result, with all of these system failures happening, we end up kind of like this little girl or boy. I think it's a little girl, though. The hair is long. Um, and standing before a bridge. She can't even see the end of the bridge, never mind seeing what's beyond it. It's very, very vague. Um, but she stands there and she's looking at it. I have chosen this picture because in every hero's journey, we are made to come nose to nose with our own vulnerability. And it's very uncomfortable. That's why the hero's journey is so uncomfortable. In a culture that denies um, and kind of vilifies one's vulnerability. It's very hard for us to end up uh, nose to nose with it. The degree to which we eschew this vulnerability, the degree to which we are armored up to protect ourselves from feeling vulnerable, is the degree to which we're actually disconnected from being able to move forward. Um, vulnerability is is actually the um it's who we were before we put all the armor on it that's why it feels we feel so vulnerable I think back when we were children at certain points we learned to armor up over those parts of our heart and our vulnerability for very good reason so we are now within these different systems um and this deep uncertainty everywhere we are now nose to nose with this vulnerability. Um, and things keep cascading further and further. So I'm going to pay, I'm, I'm going to take a left hand turn here. Or maybe it's right hand turn. And these are um, wave scenarios for COVID-19 as put forth by SIDRAP. And SIDRAP stands for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. And it's a group of scientists um, from many places, uh, two of my favorite virologists, epidemiologists, bioterrorists, um, are part and parcel of it, um, uh, Lips Mark Lipsich and uh, Osterholm. And they came out with this. This is a great website. It is like, it's kind of like COVID-19 central. Um, and go back to the very beginning to really get a feel for how, how um, comprehensive this is. These are the people um, who co countries call and say, explain the science and help me craft a policy for my people. And I am not, I am using these people because, again, it's our system's failure. The CDC, uh, the FDA, and our other groups have basically been missing in action. And I mean, even, even internationally, they've said that they are calling, but the CDC isn't responding. The whole rollout of testing, the whole rollout of so much, uh, uh, even of guidelines, was very, very flawed. And so this is another system here, uh, the communication system we have between um, uh, our respective institutions and the rest of us um, is also compromised. So I'm, I basically have gone elsewhere. Uh, I, don't, I don't fully and completely trust it. So they have said, we don't know. We don't know enough about this disease. We don't know. We don't know. We just don't know. And anyone who says they know for certain um, is probably not being truthful. Nobody has a crystal ball. So the first scenario they call peaks and valleys. And it's kind of, it's not, the peaks aren't too high, the valley's not all the way back down, they're not all the same size. Um, but every one of these um, possible scenarios 
carry out into the summer of 2021. Um, <clears throat> the second one is the fall peak. And the fall peak, if you look, is got, um, you know, that peak for the, the late winter, like, you know, uh, in January and February in the spring. <clears throat> and then it has this huge peak in the fall with other peaks following after that um, at, at different rates. And again, going out to 2021, possibly the summer of 2021. And then the third one is what they call the slow burn. One big peak and then everything's kind of easy does it. It's a, a little bit going on here and there. So returning to the very first one again, the peaks and valleys, in order for that to be how it unfolds for us, there has to be a degree of mitigating measures in place and kept in place um, in order for it to be controlled enough. So we have peaks and valleys, and that means we will have cases um, occur and we're going to have deaths occur, but they're not going to overwhelm um, everything. They're, they're going to be kind of expected and keep on moving out. We are not doing the mitigating measures in order for this scenario to take place. Um, and I'll go into that in a moment. So scenario two, this is what the pandemic of 1918 did. It's also what it did in 1957 to 1958, as well as 2009 and 2010. In fact, the authors state that this scenario is what most, excuse me, what most pandemics do do. Um, they, there's a secondary, uh, there's, a, there's a peak and then there's a big peak in the fall. Um, and then the third scenario they call the slow burn and it's really kind of this gentle ride, you know, no big waves here. Yeah, there are new cases. Yeah, people are dying, but it is this steady state without any big extremes. We're not doing enough for that to be what happens either. <coughs> Excuse me. So the author said that there are three three things that will influence which scenario we end up with. And that is what mitigating measures are in place at the time of the wave. How much testing are we doing? How much mask wearing? How much uh, hand washing? <laughs> how much isolating? How much contact tracing? And how much isolating of those who may be uh, at risk or who are testing positive? Um, the second is that where are we? There's a geographic component to this, such that really big cities, you know, um, like Houston right now, they're they're in, they're having trouble. Really big cities will probably have a greater hit than being out in you know out in the boonies in Texas. Texas has a lot of empty land, so um, the most likely cases out there are going to be from you know, church or going to the store uh, rather than just living in a big city where the, where the uh, contact is so close and so consistent. That's also part of it is there's a, there's a viral load that goes on with it. And then the third thing is how quickly we move to put those mitigating measures, the ones I just named, into place up to and including shutting back down. So one of the things the authors said was that number three, the slow burn, no pandemic has ever manifested in this manner, <laughs> um, but that it is a possibility. It just has never happened. Uh, they are also bracing based on the fact that um, with the fall peak, uh, keep in mind, that coming this fall, and we're doing a lousy job of contact tracing, testing, of uh, face uh, mask wearing uh, in many places, not across the board, but we are going to have influenza A and influenza B, as well as COVID, all among the population, especially when we open up the schools. And what that means is, I don't think influenza A is going to say to influenza B, hey, B. COVID's got us covered. Let's go take a vacation. That's not going to happen. We're going to have all three passing around the population. And even if you get influenza A 
or you get influenza B, you're going to be absolutely terrified that you've gotten COVID-19. And the testing with regard to it is um, questionable uh, at best. It's not 100%. There's a lot of um, false negatives. Uh, so who knows? Uh, there's also a lot of question, and there's still question with regard to how long antibodies last. So I think we're in from the healthcare crisis, I think, uh, which is just one of our crises, <laughs> is, is we're, it's, it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, Mother Earth, when she shrugged, uh, is kind of really making sure um, uh, that, we get, that we get it. Um, as a friend of mine said, it's kind of like Mother Earth put all the naughty children in time out. <laughs> Think about what you're doing and what you need to do instead. And I think there's, it fe certainly feels like that. Um, so here's just a small list of the number of industries that have been affected. I didn't even put airlines up because it's so depressing. Um, but that's one of the hard parts here is that there is an entanglement with regard to our healthcare crisis and our economic crisis. I was going to be going and looking for facts and figures and all of these, um, you know, specialists, um, the experts, and some I couldn't find. Um, our, our, our government actually, um, when it comes to our, um, our numbers and uh, economic stuff has actually removed um, many of the um, pages going back uh, from 2017 on. So those are difficult. Um, but globally, there is no country that is not going to have a negative GDP going forward. The U.S. may have less than like Great Britain, um, but if you look at like the, the World Banking um, uh, spokespeople or their website, we're in for a very, very tough time. And keep in mind that in our country, Every single person who has lost their employment um, has, there's a large percentage that have also lost their health insurance. And um, what we're looking at, we have rolling crises coming down the road here. Uh, we know for a fact that um, uh, going to the doctor the minute you have symptoms, um, in order to be tested is probably really important if we're going to keep the spread down. But if you don't have a health insurance, you're not gonna be likely to get that. And thus you can't protect yourself or your kid. So the economics um, awaiting us is pretty difficult. And I'm, I'm gonna to touch upon this again a little later. Um, I don't know. My teachers would say, these are just the two you're talking about, that we have other crises. And those other crises are the crises of unexpressed grief. How many people have ended up with loved ones who died alone? Did you know that? I, a lot of people know this, but a lot of people, I know personally people <laughs> who ended up with a loved one, no hospital beds. They were in a bed, but they were in a hallway and people were just dying around them because of the triaging occurred. And I want you to think about the, I always think about the nursing staff, that was where I started. And I was a very young person, nursing provided me an avenue through which I could do what I'm best at, which is helping people. You know, every single one of you, if you were here, you're a helper. You're someone who cannot be main inactive when you see human suffering. So that's the same truth for those nurses and many of the doctors. They chose this profession because it gave them an avenue through which to be that helper. Well, there's no training for triaging and having people just die in hallways. So there's going to be a degree not only of exhaustion, especially by the end of this, this fall, and I mean not just physical, but emotional um, uh, exhaustion as well, there's also going to be a bit of trauma. And um, because of the work that we do, we're part of that cleanup crew. So um, oh, we've got, 
we've got a, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us, but we're not done with the journey yet. You cannot fix the trauma while you're still in the foxhole. It can only be fixed. It can only be dealt with uh, once we're out of that foxhole. All right, enough with all the, the bad news. <laughs> Uh, it can get it can get it can get really depressing, and I I find with a lot of I have friends and people calling me to help for me to help me reframe things for them in a more positive light, because everywhere you look, um, we are in uh, we are in uncharted waters. So, if you take a look at this image, uh, this is what uh, Joe Campbell called the meeting of the mentor and the crossing of the threshold. In Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, this is when the Wicked Witch of the West, uh, uh, well, before her, uh, uh, Glenda, the Good Witch, arrives. That's her mentor. Um, in uh, uh, The Matrix, um, you know, Neo meets his, his uh, mentor. We all, we all meet a mentor. In this hero's journey, I am of the opinion, my read of it, is that COVID is our mentor. COVID is, is going to be walking us through these interlocking and deeply entangled um, <clears throat> set of crises we have. So I want you to just take a look at this imagery for a moment. It's kind of cold and uninviting. Um, uh, you know, it's there's some snow on the ground, everything's died back. The um, gateway itself is round and it's called a moon gateway by the way, meaning that it's then associated with the subconscious mind, because the sun is the conscious mind, the moon is the subconscious mind. And notice too that this gateway is made of stone. Stones endure. I mean, that is, that is one of the most amazing things about stones. They endure. And that, the, 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 the from that point of view, with that piece of knowledge, that means that this is a very, very ancient gateway that we are being walked through. And we are being walked through it globally. This is a gateway all of the human tribe um, is walking through at the same time, almost regardless of where we are on the planet. When we cross over that threshold, if you look at this imagery, if it's possible, the trees look even more bare over there and the snow might even be a little bit deeper. I can't see, but it kind of looks that way. When we walk over that threshold, we walk over with all of our um, unchallenged assumptions still unchallenged. We walk over with all of our beliefs, whether they are working or not, or need to be rewritten. They're still coming with us. All of the habits of thinking are coming with us. All of the habits of behaving, all of the habits of feeling and of relating to people are coming with us. It is only through the journey itself that we come to recognize what's no longer serving us, what no longer works, what will not bring us to where we want to go. Um, but it all comes forward with us through this, um, through this gateway to the other side. And then we enter, we are on this journey. <laughs> Um, and it is in earnest once we walk over. And notice again the imagery. If you see, it's a lone kind of small boat <laughs> on a very large ocean, um, kind of feels tiny. And it's guided only by the light of the moon, a very full moon that it almost seems to be rising out of the ocean itself. Um, so the ocean is the sub subconscious mind and that vessel is, is us, you know, that's, that's my life right now. Um, I'm on this vast ocean. I can't really plume its depths or its breath. I can't see well enough. And the only thing I have guiding me, because that's especially so many of the experts are not guiding us. So much of the information is not being given. So much of what's guiding me is my own gleanings, my own intuition, my own research, my own looking for what needs to be done or not done. Because the systems, the systems are failing us. So on this journey, um, I, uh, Campbell labels its tests, allies, and enemies are revealed. And um, in the Alpha Theta, 
Those tests are our brain map. They're the ISI. They're the memory testing. They're the um, attentional uh, difficulties testing that we do, whatever the testing is. But here in the COVID-19, the testing is, is, is all wrapped up with all these system failures. How do I, like that, like that rock slide, how do I get to where I want to be despite the fact that the, um, uh, uh, the system has failed, the system is too shaky, or the system is questionable. And in that, as we, when I went around that rockfall, what I ended up doing, and that was a test, was that I had to confront my own vulnerability, my own fears. I mean, I'm out in the middle of the desert where there's, you know, sidewinders and rattlesnakes and scorpions and all kinds of things. Um, so those were part of the testing. But in that, those fears, you could call my enemies. They're, they're the, the, the um, weaknesses, if you will. But through that, also finding and touching base with my commitment, as well as my courage, in order to also find the strength of it as well, um, which would be the allies. And through that, um, uh, that touching, that touch base with that, with that courage and with that uh, trust in my own ability to use a compass, or, or in this case, to wade through information when the uh, information is hard to come by, do I then come to be able to say, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. Um, and if you think about it, when you were getting ready, when many people were getting ready to open their offices, and I know some people have not, some people have actually gone to home training, um, but some have opened. So it was really looking at, um, so where are my vulnerabilities? How do I protect me? What do I need to provide for my protection? And what are my clients' vulnerabilities? What do I need to provide for their protection? Um, what am I protecting? <laughs> Who am I protecting? So as you make this journey, um, and you, as I, as, um, as I walked up that mountain, for instance, um, uh, with a little rattle in hand to let everybody know I was coming, you know, the snakes and scorpions, um, really, really coming to see that my own fear was, was what was being revealed to me and that I could go past it and that it actually serves a very good purpose, but isn't really needing to stop me. So as we move through this COVID-19, I'm uh, that central issue, uh, the ordeal, or the central question that is being asked of us, the central theme of what we're going through is, is revealed. And I think, again, I said at the beginning, the words provide and protect apply here. I don't think the theme has changed. And as I move forward, we'll explore that a bit. So as we identify what the theme is, we actually get a glimpse of, in the alpha theta, you could say it's a glimpse of the individual before they layered up over that vulnerability, um, armored up, we're all armored up. And, um, but here with regard to the, the, the COVID and its interlocking crises, um, we we are actually getting glimpses of maybe who we intended to be. You know, if you look at, um, I think it's terrible, horrible, <laughs> at the same time, this the civil unrest that we're going through, it's terrible what is going on. I'm, I'm just heartbroken on the one hand, but it's absolutely fantastic. And I say this because there, I often go onto the internet and what I'm doing is listening to the collective talk to itself what you are finding, there are all these groups popping up. Um, recovery from racists, uh, that's one group. Uh, they're kind of closed groups on social media. Another one is, um, uh, I didn't know I was a racist. <laughs> um, and it's really, it's really this whole education thing with, with white people is basically what it is coming around and saying, you know, it's not anybody's job to teach us about this. We need to teach ourselves. And there are book lists and there are podcasts and there are so many things going on. So I'm really excited about that because we actually cannot fix that problem until we come to acknowledge that um, that problem it really does exist and what it looks like and feels like. So that's part of what we're looking at. And I think part of that glimpse is that is that really who we want to be is being asked more globally, if not personally. Um, uh, so 
that's part of the, the journey here. In this, I have put up, I use this in the alpha theta, and I call this the power of, sorry, the pyramid of power or the pyramid of privilege. And in the alpha theta, I talk about wherever our client sees themselves on this pyramid, will have a direct result with, uh, or a bearing influence with regard to how they see themselves, period. Um, if you notice, a pyramid has very small little place at the top. It's not, you know, it's just a small place. That's why it's the pyramid of privilege. And the vast majority is at the bottom. So there are many ways you can, you know, uh, look at this. One way is you can also look at this as the pyramid of system our systems all one upon the other and the bricks there if you look at it the stones used um are kind of the um the nuts and bolts of it the facts and figures of it perhaps but the mortar that holds it together what's being revealed is that that mortar holds all of our isms holding it together. It's been built with all of the isms built in. And so again, I'm going to pick up those words, provide and protect. And the question here is, or the gleanings here are, that in our systems that are now kind of failing and stuttering and beginning to kind of almost fall apart, who is able to provide for what they need? How do they provide for what they need? Who has no problem providing for themselves or for their loved ones? And who are we protecting? What are we protecting? How do these systems work together such that those protections remain in place? And do we still want those protections there? So I think to a degree, think protect has been expanded to go beyond my office, my home, my physicality in this body and those that I love to now really expand outward and to look at everyone else. All of those people who have lost their jobs, as I said, probably now don't have healthcare. How are they gonna get treatment? And many, many hospitals are floundering under the weight of the COVID-19 because they make their money from the elective surgeries, which are not happening. And when the hospital gets overwhelmed by the COVID, not only are you not having elective surgeries, you may not get into the ER for a car, a car wreck, maybe a really long wait, <laughs> or a heart attack, or a stroke. Everything slows down. When the healthcare system is overwhelmed, mortality rises but not just the mortality from the COVID, but mortality from everything. So the protection um, of our healthcare system, <laughs> I can't believe we are in this situation, turns out to be pretty important. And so does the ability for people to protect themselves in that system. So every single uh, hero's journey, both personal as well as global comes to an end we are not at the end um i think we've got a pretty pretty rough fall ahead of us um you know we haven't even hit <laughs> we haven't hit um wildfire season yet nor have we hit the flooding in the middle of the country season yet and we haven't hit hurricane season yet so this could be difficult <laughs> as we move forward. There's a lot of stuff, and every one of those are being predicted uh, predicted as being uh, uh, kind of heightened and a little bit worse this year, and they were before COVID ever ever hit. So we'll we'll see. But one really good hurricane, and I heaven only knows what's going to happen um, with with the healthcare system and with the um, uh, the spreading of COVID. Um, so the, the journey though will come to an end. We're just not there yet. Um, and Campbell calls it, it's the rebirth. And the whole of this journey is like an initiatory process. There is a before, very definite before, and there is an after. We have left the before and we are in the middle. We have yet to make it to the after. 
and the elixir that's spoken of here is our own wisdoms. That's what we are birthing. Um, as we move through this, this, this uh, interlocking, <laughs> I want to top. I want to top the entangled mess of um, of crises. And there's going to be. I mean, there are. Oh golly, kids have these really weird syndrome. They don't have a name for it. I think it's called pediatrics vascular inflammatory and but but it's different than the normal one these kids have, when they test positive for covid they had no symptoms but a number of months later they have a um inflammatory process that is life-threatening going on there is also bbc just had a um a thing out um this week and they were talking about there being another, I think it was called actually, there's another pandemic after this one. And what they were saying was that uh, 300 studies worldwide show that a certain percentage of people who get better from COVID have really bizarre neurological diseases they never had before. They can be as simple as migraines, or they can be really bad seizure disorders or the lack of taste. In any case, it is recognized now that there's a whole other group of um, diseases arising out of having contracted um, uh, COVID to begin with, even though you have gotten better. And then there are all, as I have said, there are all these little groups popping up of people who have been declared cured of COVID, but they can't do activities of daily living. They can't go up and downstairs. They're permanently on oxygen. Um, they keep hoping it's going to get better. Um, many of these people are younger, not older, by the way. In fact, many of the infections now are happening just like in Italy and in Spain. Uh, they are occurring in the 30, 20, 30, and 40-year-olds. So um, we are nowhere near the end of this, this particular journey. So as we move forward, by virtue of our licensure, our education, and by the way we were made, meaning we are the helpers, we're the ones that move in because we can't, we can't stand human suffering. We just are moved to action. That's how we're wired. That's why we do what we do. And my teachers always called it um, a healer of the heart and head. So in the center, uh, that's the brain because that's the neurofeedback and what we work with. But going ahead as we work our way through this and then as we begin to do the cleanup because we'll have to be a team, a part of that team as well. It is important to remember how um, uh, a gentle curiosity, a gentle trusting of ourselves and the importance of playfully attempting to work with solutions and most important is remembering to laugh um, and to find reasons to laugh and to work with our clients to give them reasons to laugh um, even if you're telling them a joke that laughter is what reconnects us to our hope in the west you see this black horse and it's running along the ocean the ocean is uh, symbolic of the ocean of love and mercy and the black horse is um, uh, really symbolic of the unknown, which is where we are. And in that unknown, um, it is kind of the darkness. We find ourselves in the darkness. But it is the darkness that defines the light. And if we are to find the light, sometimes we have to walk into that darkness. Um, and then up in the, the north of the white horses, uh, again, in that along the shores of the ocean of love and mercy. And this is really this willingness to examine our um, assumptions, our assumptions about systems, our assumptions about our role in this, our assumptions that we always thought would work, but maybe isn't um, or won't. And then in the East is, uh, that is where the sun rises. It is connected with illumination and being able to see. And it's a gentle reminder that Knowledge and education is not wisdom. Wisdom only occurs as we make this journey. So I would like to leave with, end with a quote. It's by Brene Brown, and it is, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And thank you for listening.
Yeah, thank you, Barb. That's great. And I must say, I know we're at the top of the hour, but your 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 uh, information about the COVID, the virus, what we've gone through, what we can expect, seems to just fit everything I'm reading and seeing from the health, you know, yeah. the health uh, oriented material. Now, Pence is giving, as we speak, a talk about the COVID virus, and they said the encouraging news is that most of the cases are under 35. Why is that encouraging? <laughs> They're the ones running around ignoring the rules. Not so, only that, they're the ones with the, uh, the long-term after effects too. Yeah, 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 they, they still are learning. Yeah, yeah. They're still yeah, learning yeah. about this disease impact on people, especially younger people now. But thank yeah. you, that was lovely. Any quick, are uh, you able to take a few quick questions? You got time? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I All also right. want to say thank you, Barb, before we take questions and say the, the larger perspective of the spiritual and the journey that we're on is great to enlarge the context in which I've been thinking about this. So I really appreciate that as well. Oh, I'm so glad. It really does help when you get the context. When you take that point of view and expand it, it, it for me, it helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any, any, predictions on, any predictions on how long it might take to develop a vaccine? I know they normally take about 10 years, but maybe they'll be speeded up somehow. What well, are your the absolute absolute fastest one was the Ebola um, vaccine, and that's just... it on, and it, I don't know why it. Yeah. I'm saying, what is it? Like, uh, I'm, I'm just afraid the middle of work. It's background noise. Hang on a second. Okay, so the there fastest one was the Ebola was an Ebola vaccine. The Ebola then, I do believe, mutated, um, but that took four years, and the one before that was six years, and that was smallpox back in the 70s. So I'm a little reluctant to hang my head on the vaccine, and I am because there have been a number of vaccines that were shortcutted through the FDA, and they are not on the market now. And they are not on the market now because they kill too many people. So um, uh, I, I, I just, it may happen. There's an enormous amount of money. And then with the political thing uh, over our heads as well, I mean, you could be held over the barrel. You know, you give us the trade deal we want, or there's there's no vaccine for you. So I mean, there's a lot of um, crazy variables going on. I personally am not hanging my hat on a vaccine anytime soon. Neither am I. And a lot of doctors are saying if they, when the first ones come out, let's wait and see a while how they do before you go and get one. <laughs> you know. There you go. Hey, Barb, this is Melissa. Oh, hi, hi Melissa. How are you? I'm Just well. real, real quick, could you, that was wonderful, um, but could okay. you real quick give me the spelling of that, um, the website where you pulled those three scenarios of, yes, you know, the, it's, yep, it's C as in Charlie, I as in in, D as in dog, R as in Richard, A as in apple, P as in paper, and it stands for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. And when you get on there, they'll have a section on COVID. Just go, they, you have to go down to go back. Um, and I believe they did the possible scenarios maybe in March um, or in February. It's on there. Um, but you'll find it's like COVID central. I'm telling you, SIGRAP is fabulous. Yeah, that I'm going to go ahead and post it on the listserv. I got Great. it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. You're a great lecturer, by the way. I really enjoyed your enthusiasm and your energy and your discussion about making sure we all remember to laugh. That was good. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> Okay, looks like we're at the top of the hour and questions have subsided. Um, so we'll get together again on Monday night for uh, Neuro at Night. Uh, do we have anything happening Monday night, Rob? Uh, well, there's, it's an open discussion right now unless we get some maps. Okay. Uh, I have, but then we I have, have a Lyme. I have a new Lyme person that I think I'll, I have That'd be great. a write up and everything okay. on, so we'll present her. If nobody sends for anything. That.
All right, that's perfect. And then starting Wednesday, Richard's going to start doing a lecture a week on. Um, uh, I'm having a senior moment there, Richard. Methylation. 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 Yes. Methylation. <laughs> yes. And, and QEEG. <laughs> and QEEG. Yep. <laughs> All right, folks, have a great weekend. Uh, have a great safe. weekend, everybody. Stay yeah. safe, stay healthy. Bye, all. Bye.